Welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future and future creators, and for all those like really great stories. I'm Ira Pastor, your life sciences ambassador, along for the journey today. So today we are going to go down the fascinating pathway of advanced neurotechnologies. Uh, and in doing so, we are going to be joined again by some of our friends from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as DARPA, uh, which as we've discussed on previous shows is an agency of the US Department of Defense, uh, responsible for both the development of a different emerging technologies for use by the military, ultimately making investments in technology for national security, but at the same time, they have a parallel mission to uh, execute advanced research and development projects to sort of push the frontiers of science and technology often beyond the needs of the military, ultimately for uh, civilians. Um, so a little bit of background for the discussion today. Um, a brain-computer interface uh, broadly refers to a, a neurotechnology that allows for the communication uh, between one's brain uh, and some external device. Uh, it's a little different from the term neuromodulation in the sense that brain-computer interfaces allow for a bi-directional flow of information, uh, and they are directed at a wide range of possibilities in terms of researching, mapping, augmenting, and repairing uh, various cognitive and sensory motor functions. Uh, over the last several dec or few decades, DARPA has been working on, on very sophisticated uh, neurotechnologies on this front that rely on surgical implantation of electrodes, uh, either in the central or the peripheral nerve nervous system, and they've demonstrated success in areas like the neural control of prosthetic limbs, uh, restoration of the sense of touch to limbs, uh, just sort of relief in intractable psychiatric illnesses like depression, improvement of memory. However, um, due to the inherent risk of surgery involved in invasive technologies, um, so far these types of tools are somewhat limited in terms of the clinical need. Uh, for the military population and then ultimately the wider civilian population to benefit from these tools, uh, novel non-surgical interfaces are going to be required. Uh, joining us today for this fascinating show uh, is Dr. Al Amandi. Uh, Dr. Amandi is a program manager in DARPA's biological technology office, uh, and he's a major thought leader in this space and working truly, as a cutting, a really bleeding edge of possibilities here. Uh, Dr. Armani joined DARPA back in June of 2017. His focus is on neurotechnology and human machine interaction, and his current portfolio of work explores novel neuro interface system architectures that are applicable to broad user populations, uh, improving the performance of neural interfaces, and ultimately their application through use of third wave artificial intelligence, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, Dr. Amandi joined DARPA from the Space and Naval Warfare System Center, uh, located in Charleston, South Carolina, where he's Chief Technology Officer, Deputy CTO to uh, uh, their headquarters chief in the Atlantic region. Uh, there he led the science and technology competency, which included uh, personal focused on um, basic and applied sciences, technology transition, technology transfer. Uh, before his tour there, he was a pioneer for software-defined radio research initiatives at the Air Force Research Lab in Rome, New York. Uh, Dr. Mani has a PhD in neuroscience and a master of science in electrical engineering from Syracuse, a bachelor of science degree in electrical engineering from Wilkes University. Uh, a lot to discuss today, so uh, no, no more delay. Dr. Alamandi, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule today to come on the show today. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, typically, we start the show off by, by giving our guests the floor just for a little bit to introduce themselves. Um, if you could take a little time just to uh, uh, give a little bit of your background, you know, where you grew up, uh, how you got interested in science, uh, you know, how you developed this interest in both electrical engineering and neuroscience, and ultimately this passion that's developed over the years for sort of the, the convergence of the two. That'd be great. Oh, yeah, sure. So, um... I think that you know my path probably wasn't the typical path. I uh, I was in high school and I knew I liked electronics in general. And I remember one garage experiment that I did where I loved you know walkie-talkies as a kid or something. I think I was in ninth grade. <laughs> and uh, and so my friends were out on go karts and bikes and things like that. And and I had the walkie-talkie. So we decided um, you know everybody have a walkie-talkie so we can talk to each other. But we realized we didn't get too far in the neighborhood. We just started dropping. Right, and we didn't, we couldn't hear anybody anymore. It was noisy and staticky. So, I mean, like any good kid, I'm thinking, well, then obviously it needs more power, 
right? That's what it needed. So it's only running off a nine volt battery. What would happen if I connected a 12 volt battery? Yeah. I mean, that would probably work, right? And so I, I took the back off the radio and I remember holding it in my hand and I hooked it up to my car battery and I tested it. And my friend's like, yeah, well, it's not any stronger, but it definitely doesn't sound very good. And with that, one of the capacitors on the back of the walkie-talkie popped, right? And so a capacitor is, you know, this, this dielectric wrapped in metal. Well, this thing pops, and it pops in my hand and cuts my hand open. And that was kind of my, my first entrance into, okay, what's this electronics all about? Because obviously it's not all about more power. Sure. Um, so there's more to it. And so I just started, you know, taking things apart, looking at things. You know, I remember taking my dad's stereo apart, just trying to figure out how that little needle moves from left to right when you're selecting your stations on the radio. Uh, never did get that back together the way it should be. Uh, so he decided that rather than me getting into his stuff, he worked at Sears at the time. And, uh, and they were renovating one of the stores. His job was, was to uh, basically be the visual merchandise manager that Sears used. So, so one of the things he did is he brought home this, this pinball machine that didn't work. He said, here, work, work on this instead, right? So sure enough, we took it apart. We had all these extra things and ordered some things and finally got that up and running. And that was the beginning of our, our game room in our basement. But it became clear to me as I was going through this kind of thing that I really liked toying around with electronics, trying to figure out how to make things work, understand it, and, uh, and you know, how can I apply it to different things? So I was, you know, my, my parents didn't go to college. Uh, my, my background, you know, my, all my immediate family, nobody had went to college. And so I didn't have anybody to kind of like look towards and thought, well, what does that mean? You know, when you're getting ready to go into higher education beyond high school, uh, my plan was to get out of high school and start working. And so I remember a, a, a discussion I had with my guidance counselor in high school. And I was, it was my senior year. And, uh, and, <laughs> And she said, so what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to work on electric circuits. I want to design electric circuits. She said, well, that's different. Are you going to want to work on them or do you want to design them? Because if you want to work on them, that's a technician. If you want to design them, that's an engineer. And that's very different. And I'm like, oh, so what does that mean? She said, well, that means you got to go to college. So here I am halfway through the senior year thinking, okay, this, this isn't good. Right? Because I, I, thank God I had taken, you know, I loved math. So I was taking math classes. I was taking science classes. One thing I didn't like was chemistry. Mm. So I started applying for schools, and the one thing that was holding me back was chemistry. And so I took chemistry over the summer, and right after high school, I got into a, 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 a community college, got chemistry under my belt, and then I was accepted into university. And then that was the beginning of the beginning for me, as far as really thinking as, uh, about topics from an engineering perspective. So I got into um, electrical engineering at Wilkes University, uh, which is in Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania and studied electrical engineering there. Had a lot of experience, even in an undergrad, with building devices. We, um, there was a uh, RCA plant down the street, not too far, and we had gotten donations from their plant where they make their chips, mm -hmm. and uh, those pieces were donated to the university. So I had gotten a lot of experience with um, wafer design and uh, depositing materials on wafers, building transistors, things that you wouldn't typically get in a bachelor program. Uh, and then my first job was working for the uh, 45th Engineering Installation Group. It's an Air Force organization mm -hmm. uh, up in Rome, New York. It was at Griffiths Air Force Base. So Griffiths Air Force Base, is, you know, they had the B-52s. That's also where they had uh, the Northeastern Air Defense Sector. So if something were to come into our airspace and they need to scramble jets to go and check it out, they would actually fly out of Griffiths. Um, so it was a really interesting viewpoint of military and military operations. And I was in one of the engineering organizations at that base, just mm -hmm. kind of soaking all this in. And so I was doing satellite work. I was installing what they called AppSatcom at the time, or Milstar, which is Military Communications Satellite Systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, my job was flying all over the country, all over the, the world, installing these systems and making sure that our bases could communicate through satellite communications. And uh, just as it would stand, uh, about two blocks down the street, was this other Air Force organization called Air Force Research Lab. Mm. And one of the jobs that I had as an installer was uh, putting some, some devices in at the Pentagon. And it was in the National Military Command Center. So it's just kind of like war games. You see all of these big sure. screens and everything that's happening, all this information coming in. So and there's crazy. this one, one system I was putting in. And, and I remember the general telling me, I don't want all of this in my command center. I, I need the <laughs> interface in here. But all this other stuff, put it somewhere else. 
Well, the system was never meant to be separated this way, right? It was designed one way. It was meant to be all installed. So I had to separate the device in half. And in order to do that, I had to put in these fiber optic modems and I had to figure out how to run the fiber optics and what that link margin was going to be. And the more I got into it, the more I realized I definitely like thinking through problems like this sure. and thinking through things that maybe are a little bit out of the ordinary and how do you approach this. Um, so it turns out this organization down the street from where I was working was Air Force Research Lab. Mm -hmm. So I went down there and I knocked on the door literally and said, you know, I'm interested in maybe moving from this one Air Force organization to another. And so one thing uh, led to another. I was hired there in the Air Force Research Lab and that's where I started in um, looking at software defined radios. And that was the very first time I remember my boss telling me, um, hey, you know, we have this modem, we have this basically this, this, this front end of the radio, uh, and we're trying to figure out how to make it more flexible and programmable. We also have a program looking at the, 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 the power amplifiers of radios. And power amplifiers typically are really efficient over very small bands of operation. But if you want to build a multi-band radio, Mm -hmm. The only way to do this in an efficient way is to try and figure out how to build these power amplifiers that they can basically be efficient over much wider bands, many okay. more channels. And in order to get this technology to work, we had to figure this out. So that became my, my project. And so I, I was given $500,000 and say, well, you know, let's see how you can bring this modem together with this power amplifier and make a software-defined radio, which we didn't know was called software-defined radio back there. You know, we were just early, like we know it's software programmable, mm -hmm. so we'll call it that. Um, well, it turns out that uh, we, that program grew to about two and a half million. The, Air, the Army got aware of it and they said, you know, we want to do the same. So could we give you our requirements? We'll give you another two and a half million. And we grew it to a $5 million program. Hmm. And so, you know, I'm a relatively young engineer in this whole process. And uh, so this program's growing and then the Navy heard about it. So then the Navy jumped on and then they gave us some funding. And then... Uh, the director of the lab at that time said, you know, I think we really have something here. It looks like it's working. I think it's very possible that we can build these, these multi-spectrum radios. Um, how about if we try and get some more funding out of the DOD, at the DOD level? And at the time, and I don't know if you remember, but there was something going on called Star Wars. Sure. And it was... It was a lot of uh, work was going on in space, a lot of new development yeah. technologies happening there. And then there's something that, that a lot of people haven't heard of, and it was called Balanced Technology Initiative. Okay. And that the BTI. And so what was happening is a lot of companies that were doing work that wasn't space-based, they felt they weren't getting the funding that a lot of space-based companies and organizations were. Mm -hmm. So they basically said, could we come up with another pot of money that would balance all the, the, all the, the, the money that's being spent in space-based research could we also have money that balances that out for ground-based kind of research? And that was called Balanced Technology Initiative. It's ran by John Transu, I believe, at the time. So we go down there and we, we set up a meeting with, with Dr. Transu and we tell him that we've got this idea. Uh, we've got all the, the, all the agencies are on board now. Air Force, Army, Navy are all tied together. We've got the contract in place and we think we really have something. And he agreed. And so that program grew from a, a $500,000 program to over a $25 million program. Mm. Uh, it became international, so there was a lot of international work that we were doing. And uh, so I was at Rome Lab when all this was happening. I was the program manager of the effort. And I remember my boss telling me, you know, you've got a lion by its tail and just hold on to this because this thing's going to last a while and it's going to make a big change in the way that we, we do uh, comms in, in the government. And that's true today. Um, so there was a point in time where at Rome Lab, they gave me the opportunity uh, to start thinking about neural networks and artificial intelligence and things like that. It was just when, just when this stuff was starting. And they had said that um, they're really interested in looking at it from a biological perspective because a lot of, uh, at the time, it's still, still true today, but, but not as much so. Yeah. At the time, you know, a lot of the AI and neural nets, neural nets mainly back then, um, weren't necessarily based on biological um, aspects, right? There were some mathematical ideas, things that were being, you know, perceptrons, things like that. There is no perceptron in, in the biological neural system, right? But mm -hmm. there, are, there, are, there are mathematical versions of things, right, in order okay. to get these neural networks to work. So they said, well, what about if we looked at neural nets from a biological perspective and try and bring these two fields together uh, and maybe we can learn something from it? 
And so I was already matriculated into the master's program at Syracuse University, getting my master's in electrical engineering. And they had a neuroscience program. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Air Force, it's the same across all services, are very, very flexible and very forthcoming in trying to get you to go back to school. And if you want to continue to build on your education, they're 100% they're behind you. Um, so I was lucky there. And I said, well, I'd like to get into the PhD program at Syracuse and start learning more about neuroscience because basically my employer is asking me to start looking at you know, neural networks from a biological perspective and what could I learn from that. So that got me into the neuroscience program at Syracuse. And I was more interested in brain research than I was in peripheral research at the time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do a lot of that at Syracuse, but it turned out that a professor of mine uh, knew a professor out at University of California at San Francisco, which is one of the leading neuroscience schools. And so uh, it turned out that I was able to go out there and work under Ken Miller um, for about four years or so. And I'd come back to Syracuse and I would kind of bounce back and forth and kind of run two jobs at the same time. But anyway, fast forward through all of that, I ended up uh, defending at Syracuse, got my neuroscience degree, and then um, went over to Spavor and worked out of Spavor in, in Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And so from there, you know, as all good things go, they promote you out of your bench work right into management. And so, and so I ended up going into a management, management position. Uh, they were very interested in standing up a, a research and development capability. Um, at Spaywar in Charleston, you know, they were known for installation. They weren't necessarily known for their research. And so they asked me if I could spearhead that and put that together. So when I finally left Spaywar, um, uh, we had built a multidisciplinary research center. I think we had over 20 different PhDs working together from different disciplines, uh, a sustained S&P budget, um, and a recognized research capability when I left there. And then that's when I had the opportunity to go to DARPA and that's when I got back into neuroscience science again, you know, mm -hmm. really hardcore, right? And, sure. and look at, you know, what's been done at DARPA in neuroscience. You know, we've been in this now for well over 20 years. And, you know, from the time that it very first started, and I, and I actually had a chance to be a part of that program when it started back in, I think it was 1999 or so. It's called the Bioinfra Micro Program. Okay. And, uh, and three program managers at DARPA got together and they said, you know, I wonder what would happen if we took biology, information theory, and microelectronics, and brought those three fields together, bio, info, micro, and what would come out of that? And that was some of the very, very first experimentation that DARPA did in looking at neural interfaces and what's possible um, when you take a, a neural interface and put it in the brain. And then in, in that case, um, you know, this was work that was done by, John Ch or by um, um, uh, Richard Anderson out of Caltech. Um, John Donahue, um, Arto out of Brown. These are some pioneering work mm -hmm. that was looking at, you know, can you train a, a monkey to, to pick up an arm and feed itself? And all of that was proven at that point in time. And that's when we knew that we were on to something mm -hmm. because you can literally tap into the brain, understand the neural signals, and then be able to translate that information, the language of the brain, into something that actually moves or a mechanical arm. And uh, that was the breakthrough. And then after that, a number of programs came at DARPA, you know, on the heels of this mm -hmm. uh, to build up to what we are now in a neurotech portfolio. Wonderful. Wonderful. It's, a, it's an amazing path. And I mean, it's, uh, it's it must completely have been unpredictable, right? I mean, it was, <laughs> it's not at all what I would have expected, but it, it's been, it's been a great time. Still, it's, still, yeah, it's an amazing ride. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to <laughs> the things that come next. But uh, yeah, I, so, you know, as you know, we discussed a little bit on, on previous shows, you know, when you, when you do get to DARPA, you, you, you're not just working on one thing. You, you have a, you manage as you are now a, a, a broad portfolio of, of projects, you have a certain amount of time and so forth. And so I, I've sort of put these in some semblance or <laughs> order. And I sort of like to start off sort of broadly with uh, N3, uh, the, the next generation non-surgical neurotechnology sort of has this um, mission of pursuing a path to safe, portable neural interface systems capable of reading from and writing to uh, multiple points in the brain at once. And it, it's, you know, states are this significant challenge that, you know, we've spoken about offline that, you know, between this device here and this brain in here, we have skin, we have skull, we have various membranes and so forth. Uh, and we need 
a decent signal to somehow get in and it cannot have noise and so forth. Uh, and you are looking at a range of options in terms of uh, optics, in terms of acoustics, in terms of electromagnetism and so forth. Can you talk a little bit about sort of when you move from the surgical things that were done in the past to uh, what you're doing now in terms of non-surgical, uh, what are some of these challenges and, and, and sort of this basket of uh, competencies that you need to put together to sort of <laughs> go through that barrier and, and have a, a, a potent signal once things do get through? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, as you mentioned, a, a lot of the a lot of the work previous to Ncube is, is all about taking devices and putting them on the neural tissue, in the neural tissue, whether it's the brain or whether it's peripherally in the arm and so on. And the reason why that happens is because you're trying to get the best connection to the neural tissue you possibly can. Mm -hmm. If you're going to talk to neurons and listen to neurons, you, you, know, the, you know, it's kind of like being right up next against them is really the best situation. And so what we were trying to figure out for, for Ncubed is, is it possible to build an interface which is relevant for a brain machine interface uh, and still have the accuracy that we get and the fidelity that we get when we actually put devices on the nerve or in the brain, right? Mm -hmm. So that was ultimately the, the goal here, right? And so there was a number, of, you know, at DARPA, when we set up programs, we set up these things called uh, technical areas that we're gonna go after, mm -hmm. and we also set up metrics. And so, you know, DARPA shoots for the moon on all of our programs, and so yep. the metrics that we're after is basically, I wanna build a non-invasive interface that will give me the same kind of signal quality that I would get as though I would put something in the brain or in the peripheral nerve, right? So what does that mean? So from, a, from an NQ perspective, that would mean that um, I would like to see resolutions. I would be able to be able to talk to a very small area, a very small mesoscale area of the brain, for example, which is one millimeter cube, right? And I wanna be able to have the ability to record just from that area or to be able to stimulate that area. And I wanna be able to do that in 16 different areas at the same time. Okay. And the reason 16 uh, was, it was kind of a back of the envelope calculation, but it's also based on existing data. And th there's a, a workhorse in the industry now that a lot of folks use in neural interfaces, especially cortical neural interfaces, called the Utah Array. And this array is, um, it's about a centimeter roughly on the side, and it, it's a 10 by 10 array, so there's about 100 electrodes. And so when you take these arrays and you put them in the brain, you have about 100 electrodes going into the brain, recording from that, those neurons right around where the electrodes are. Uh, over time, scar tissue builds, uh, the, the array moves around a little bit, um, things change. And it's not uncommon to see a degradation in your signal or the number of channels that you may have from the time you started to maybe a year later is significantly mm -hmm. less. But there's been work with these Utah arrays that's shown even with 16 channels, you can still get enough information to uh, reliably move prosthetic arms and, and move devices and control different types of things. So we're like, okay, well, um, this is going to be hard enough already to try and do it non-invasively. So if you can give me 16 channels of independent operation, and, and each channel is one millimeter cubed, and I can get 16 channels in one cube centimeter, which is about mm -hmm. the size of the Utah array, right? Mm -hmm. Then I got something, right? Now I think I could potentially achieve the kinds of things that I can do with surgical approaches in a non-surgical way. And that's what kind of drove the, the, all the thinking behind behind NCUBE itself. So what, what do you have to overcome in order for that to work, right? And so clearly you have to get through the skin, as you were saying, and you gotta get through the skull. And so, you know, we've been built pretty well that the brain's pretty protected. And so to get in there and get to those signals is not easy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one thing to recognize is, you know, the brain is electromagnetic tissue, right? It, there, yep. There's spikes, there's, there's electrons, there's ions, there's all kinds of things that are happening. So we can use that to our advantage, right? So we know that there are, um, you know, maybe magnetic signals that are given off. There's certain electric fields that are given off. That's how an EEG works, right? It's picking up those electric fields. Um, so we can work with electro, uh, electromagnetics. We can also um, try and use a couple other phenomena that, that we know of. We don't know exactly how they work, but we know that, for example, there's an optical signal that when, if you're shining light 
uh, let's say laser light, coherent light on a, on a nerve mm -hmm. or on a neuron, and that neuron fires. It turns out that that membrane changes in some way. It changes shape, it changes sure. you know, in different ways. And the, one of the results of that is the reflected light that would come off the neuron changes in amplitude, it changes in phase. And so if you could pick up the differences in phase and amplitude of those reflected photons, then it could give you a, uh, a correlated signal that is of how the neuron is firing itself. So maybe you're not picking up that electrical spike like you would do with an electrode, mm -hmm. but you would be picking up an optical signal, which would tell you when that neuron is firing. And you're doing all of that non-invasive to the neuron itself. So that would be another thing that we would want to do. Now, we also know that you can use ultrasound to drive neurons and you can and it's argued that there's a ultrasound signal that when that neuron fires you potentially can even pick up an ultrasound signal coming from that neuron like a, like an acoustic signal so what we wanted to do under nq is say okay let's take all these different modalities you know magnetics electrical uh, optical and and acoustic and look at different approaches that could potentially be a window into the brain not only to record but also to stimulate if we need to Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and just like you do with existing neural interfaces that are surgically implanted, can we get some of that functionality using non-invasive approaches? And that's really what the NQ program is all about. And once, um, obviously, this portfolio of uh, what we'll just call uh, neuroinformation, whether it's optical or electromagnetic, what have you, uh, is successfully uh, through uh, the barrier, this is a um, sort of a, an, un, an untouched frontier of, of information in, in many senses. And you, at DARPA, you know, works on so-called third wave artificial tech, uh, artificial intelligence technologies on various fronts. And in this particular case, uh, a lot of uh, the applications of things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, or so forth, my understanding, are for, you know, how do we uh, encode and decode this really unique form of information. Uh, can you talk a little bit per the uh, intelligent neural interfaces uh, part of the portfolio, uh, how artificial intelligence and these tools are used in sort of deciphering and coding and uncoding this, this new type of information? So uh, currently the way that um, this typically works in the field is there's different types of you know, machine language approaches that you would use mm -hmm. to record the neural signal. Um, yeah, so, to, well, to record the neural signal and then try and make sense out of it, right? Mm -hmm. This is the language of the brain. You're trying to figure out, okay, well, given this, these signals that I'm collecting on my electrode, this is what it means if I want to try and drive a servo and a prosthetic, for example. Mm -hmm. The converse is also true, right? So if I have a prosthetic, which has been sensorized, and I want to translate, let's say, when I mean sensorized, let's say you have maybe sensors on the finger of a prosthetic, and those sensors change in resistance when I, when I touch something. Well, your brain doesn't understand a change in resistance. That's not the way our system works. Okay. So you'd have to be able to figure out how to take the change in resistance and put it into a neural code that the brain can understand. And then you've got to figure out how to impose that neural code onto the nerve or into the brain, such as the, what's the best way to deliver that signal, right? So there's a couple things in the field that have been problematic. And it really is critical, in my opinion, as far as the, the tech transfer and the clinical ad adoption of these technologies in the future. Okay. There's a few things that we really need to get over. One of them is uh, something with, which we all have to do with these devices called this training. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you're dealing with a biological system that's learning all the time. Yep. You're dealing with a system that has these neural interfaces that are changing because, like I said, scar tissue builds. You might jar the interface or you know, hit yourself in the arm or, or maybe your head, and therefore the, the neural interface moves just a little bit of a micro motion, but it could potentially change the characteristics of the interface. You have all these non-stationary things that are happening. On top of that, you have a neural system in, that's learning on top of this. And so what, what we're trying to do with the artificial intelligence piece of the Intelligent Neural Interface Program is to say, can we throw AI, and specifically what we mean third wave AI, uh, to this problem? And so there's two major problems we wanna try and solve. One of them is just sustaining neural interfaces longer than maybe what they currently are today. 
And the second one is how do I maximize my information throughput that I can put into and collect from that neural interface? So those are the two main focus areas of intelligent neural interfaces. So, so let's look at um, the, the first piece, and that is uh, trying to make my interface last longer mm -hmm. and use that neural information in new ways. So the way it works today, if I had a neural interface and I'm trying to control, let's say, a robotic hand, and I'm trying to learn that, I have an, inter I have an interface, let's say, in my motor cortex, and I'm trying to move my, 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 ro my robotic hand to pick up a glass. Um, right now, you run a series of trials. The algorithms are learning these different movements. You, you go through different targets. You're getting, you know, maybe more accurate. Uh, you're fine tuning, and it's not uncommon that this training paradigm has to happen regularly. And what I mean regularly, certainly every day, possibly throughout the session, a couple times throughout the session. So think if you had a neural interface and you have to constantly do this training then that's less than best, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be able to just train up front and then be able to use it all day long. So the other problem is, is that when you do train for these types of movements, they're very specific for that movement and for that given task. So if I'm picking up a glass and I want to make sure that I don't drop it, um, my interface is learning how much pressure to apply to my prosthetic device so that I have enough friction between my prosthetic device and the glass so I don't drop it, but too little friction, it drops too much friction, I might break the glass. So you're training, you're training, you're training. But now, what about if I take the glass away and I give you a tennis ball instead? Mm -hmm. It's a different grasp movement. It's, it's a different weight. Uh, it may be having even a different texture. And it would be very hard for that training that I did on my glass now to be applied to picking up the tennis ball. I'd have to go back through a whole bunch of training again in order to do something very, very similar, but yet just slightly different, right? And so the point about third wave AI is that can you begin to infer that if I've learned how to do one movement and one task, can I take what I've learned and now apply that to a slightly different movement in a slightly different task, but not having to go through all of this training again. Okay. And that's what third wave AI is about. It, it, at least that we're looking at it from a DARPA perspective. It's this context awareness that what I've learned in one context, I can now apply to a different context, for example. Mm -hmm. And so what that means in the, my examples I'm giving you is, is maybe the, the trajectory of which I'm moving my arm is now different, but what I'm picking up is different. Maybe the weight is different. So I've got to recalculate the, the friction that I apply and the stress that I apply. And rather having to relearn each of those things, hopefully I can learn it once and then be able to, to contextually apply it across many different situations. And that's very hard to do, it turns out. Um, with the current way that we are building these devices and these interfaces. So we're hoping that applying this kind of third wave AI is um, much, more, much more applicable in the long run. So um, that's, that's huge. And, and I think you know, one of the big things in, if we can get that taken care of, then that would be a, a major uh, obstacle that's been removed in the acceptance of this technology clinically, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing is, uh, the other piece of the I, &I program is um, the, this whole point about bandwidth and in trying to impart as much information on the nerve as you possibly can. And so part of that, like I said, if you had a resistance sensor, for example, let's say you have a whole bunch of them on a hand, you know, maybe on every fingertip and on the thumb and on the palm and on the mm -hmm. side of the palm, and you have all these different sensors changing in resistance as you're touching something, You've got to figure out what's the best signal that I can build to translate that resistance signal that's coming from these sensors into the language of the brain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that in itself can be a, 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 an AI problem right there. The other problem is, is that, okay, well, now I got to be able to take this information and impart that into the nerve. So how do I use the... Um, the electrode itself and the design of the electrode so that I understand how these different currents and these different patterns of, of current that are, that are expressed across this electrode, that I can best inter interface each nerve, which is inside that bundle, for example, if it's the, if it's the, the on arm or the medial nerve in the, in the forearm. So you have to be able to understand how to build the neural code, and then you also have to understand how to impart that code onto the neuron, giving the interface that you're using. And every interface is different. There's cup electrodes, there's, uh, like I said, the Utah array, 
there's axial electrodes, there's all kinds of different things that folks have developed in order to give you this neural interface, mm -hmm. but you've got to understand how best to use that in the context that you're trying to build it in. So all of this is all about third wave AI, and mm -hmm. it's really, mm -hmm. we felt, an area that um, hasn't been explored significantly sure. uh, within the field, and it was something that we felt fit very well within um, the AI program within DARPA, and so therefore we launched the Intelligent Neural Interface Program to handle some of that. Continuing on that theme now, so you know we, we're working with the the prosthetic arm, the um, the sort of the CNS connection, the AI. Another area that you're very um, focused on, and once again spoken about a little bit offline, is this principle of haptic uh, technology. And just sort of haptic uh, broadly for the audience, referring to technologies that create an experience by touch, uh, forces, vibrations, and so forth. And here, sort of the um, sort of this part of the mission um, is the uh, a system that sort of for lack of a better way, can, it feels natural in, in the sense that it feels like an arm because of uh, not just the CNS connection, but via uh, various components of the, the peripheral nervous system that are somehow integrating. Can you talk about a little bit about haptics uh, and, and how sort of you're utilizing both sort of the CNS and the peripheral nervous system together in this particular uh, project, especially for the wounded warriors, but also you know, for, for anyone that ultimately may require sort of an artificial limb at some point, uh, you know, where we're going with this uh, and, and some of these possibilities. Yeah, the, the Haptics program is, uh, is really a lot of fun. It's one of the more mature programs that I have in the portfolio. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, it's been around for about four and a half years now. Mm -hmm. when, we're, when we come into DARPA, just a little bit of history, you know, when you come into DARPA, you, you're there for a very short period of time. And, and you have an amazing organization to work in, um, an amazing capability, but you're only there for a short time to make that difference. And so it's not uncommon that as you come in, you pick up a program that another program manager started, but they had to leave, right? And that's just the natural course of things. So to get a program started and off and running, usually it takes about a year to start a program. It takes another four years maybe to run a program. So that's a five-year window, and you're only there for four. So in my case, I came into, into uh, DARPA, as you mentioned, in June of 2017, and there was a previous program manager, Doug Weber, uh, who had started the Haptics program. And so the whole idea of Haptics is uh, whether or not, it, it's about restoration of function for those that have suffered an amputation. And in particular, although we've looked at many different types of amputation, it was mainly focused on these transradial amputations. And so that's, that's an amputation that happens if you, you know, for example, if you lost your arm somewhere between your elbow and your wrist, right? So somewhere in here, you've had an amputation. Um, most likely you have some residual muscle left in your forearm that controls your fingers. Uh, you have some residual nerve that's still in there, the medial, the ulnar nerve. And so is it possible that we could go in and attach to those nerves and attach to that residual muscle and build an interface to a prosthetic arm mm -hmm. such that you'll be able to move fingers again and not only that would you be able to feel those fingers again and that's what haptics is about so uh we took this arm it's called the, the deca arm it was built, developed by uh, dean Kamen. And, uh, by, and and uh, it's called the Luke Skywalker arm, right? Okay. And so uh, even Mark has reached out, Hamilton's reached out and said, hey, you know, great, great job on this program. He, he even loved it. <laughs> so, uh, so that's fun. Uh, and so anyway, what we did is we took the DECA arm and we sensorized it. And so we put sensors in the fingertips, in the palm, side of the hand, the thumb. And, uh, and then we basically figured out these interfaces to build that would pick up uh, signal from the residual muscle. So this is called the EMG. So you would take the, this, this electrical signal from the muscle and translate that into a signal that the servos and the motors could understand in the arm. So that would give you movement of the prosthetic arm, but it doesn't give you feeling. So you'd be able to see your arm move, but it would still feel numb to you, right? You, but so then how do you get that feedback loop? And so what Haptics is doing is, is developing a number of uh, electrodes that you put on these nerves, different types of electrodes, and try and figure out how do I impart, like I was saying earlier under the INI program, how do I impart this sensory signal, which is maybe a change in resistance, sure. into a neural language that the brain understands and put that back on the right spot on the nerve that mm. the brain can feel 
that I've got a thumb again, or I've got a forefinger again. <laughs> so that's what it's been about. And yeah. so we've gotten to this point now where we've developed all of the embedded electronics. And so that the goal here with haptics is to have people with electrodes in the residual muscle that's left over after the amputation, to have electrodes that are around the peripheral nerves and have embedded um, devices that will be able to pick up these signals and translate these signals. So you don't have to be fully wired. You know, everything will be inside your arm. And that's the, the goal in the, in, the, in the long term. So where we are right now is um, we have about 14 subjects that have been implanted with this technology. Uh, we use different types of electrodes. We have um, these axial electrodes that you can imagine like this big giant kind of telephone wire bundle with, with a bunch of wires in it. And you can sew an electrode axially along that bundle, and you're going to hit some wires, and you're going to hit all of them, but you're going to hit some wires in there. Uh, you could put a cuff around that whole bundle and listen to the nerves and try and target the nerves from outside. Mm -hmm. um, or you could take something that I was saying earlier, like a Utah array, and push it into the nerve, and each of those individual electrodes can be targeting different neurons within that, that nerve bundle. Mm. So there's different ways that you can do this. Um, uh, we have some work at Uni University of Michigan that's looking at uh, taking advantage of the fact that, you know, if you, if you have an amputation, your arm won't grow back. But one of the, the nice things that happens that we've learned with nerves is that they do like to reinnovate muscle. Mm -hmm. So in Michigan, what they do is they have a small little piece of, of muscle that they put around that nerve, and then that nerve begins to innervate into the muscle tissue. And so there's a couple of nice things that come out of that. First of all, it gives you a little bit more real estate to play with if you're trying to get to the neural signal. Now you can work with a slightly bigger muscle. Um, but the muscle also acts as an amplifier of the nerve uh, signal. So that's kind of nice. So anyway, haptics has these different ways of tapping into that nerve. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you take this sensor on a, on a hand, for example, in the DECA hand, we translate that sensor into a neural signal. And then we take that neural signal and put it into the nerve. Now, what that means on behalf of the subject is they feel that their hand is back again. And what's been really amazing on the Hapix program is a lot of folks that have prosthetic devices will refer to their device, my prosthetic, right? They'll, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll call it my prosthetic. And, and under haptics, we're hearing a number of subjects now saying my arm, right? My leg. Sure. So, there's a major breakthrough here in that the body appears as though it has, it's starting to embody this device as part of itself. Um, they're beginning to feel again. You know, if you, have a, if you have a prosthetic device, even if you can control its movement and you didn't have that haptic feedback, you would have to focus on it, like to move it around. If you see folks using prosthetics, they will watch their prosthetic all the time because mm -hmm. they don't have that haptic sense. So the only sure. feedback they're getting is through their visual system Got it. to know where their, where their prosthetic is in space. But if you have this haptic sense, or even more what we would like is, is what we call a proprioceptive sense, then you have a sense of where your, your prosthetic arm is in space without having to look at it. When you touch something, you can feel what you're touching without having to look at it. And because of that now, you're, you're acting more naturally with this arm that you would have if you had your actual arm attached to you. Uh, because of this haptic sense. And so it really is um, groundbreaking, frankly, in the, where I believe prosthetics are going in the future. Because we, we've shown that we understand how to interface to the nerve. Mm -hmm. We've shown that we understand how to take these engineered sensors and translate into a neural code that the brain understands. Sure. And now the subjects are saying that they're able to use this and referring to it as their arm again. Hmm. So these are our major breakthroughs in what I believe will be the future of prosthetics. The nice thing about haptics, many things, but one of the nice things about haptics is also the approaches that we're using don't have to be just for transradial amputees. If you've lost your arm higher up, let's say by your shoulder, now you know, that muscle that we would tap into that controls those fingers, that's gone, right? Because that was down in your forearm. So that's not a, a, an option anymore. So kind of the next place to go to get those signals would be in the spinal cord. And so there's some folks out at University of Pittsburgh that are working there, like, okay, well, if I have to go higher up and I, it's not the needle in the arm or nerve are not an option for me, then the next place to go is at the spinal cord and how do you get the information from there. Mm -hmm. uh, the same way you attach to the needle and arm nerves, you would do the same thing for a lower leg amputation. 
same, same issue, tap into the nerves that are available there and use that for a lower leg yeah, um, prosthetic. And then you would sensorize like the ball of the foot or maybe the, an the ankle and different types of areas where you would press on pressure mm -hmm. and then you would interpret that signal. So the approach would apply to many different types of prosthetics, sure. peripheral prosthetics, um, upper body and lower body. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great program. We're, like I said, about four, four and a half months in. A number of folks have the uh, implants and we're gearing up now for a take-home study. So what's so important, and some of, our, um, some of our folks have achieved that already, but what's so important about this is right now the FDA has given us the approval to use the devices in the lab. So if you're a, uh, if you're a haptic subject, for example, you know, your job is you come into the lab, you work with the, with the uh, researchers at the lab itself, and you might be there all week, and then you leave on Friday, you go back home, you take your arm off, you leave everything there at the lab, and then when you come back the next time, you put everything back on again, right? So that's less than best, but that's where we are in the development at this stage. But wouldn't it be nice if you could leave the lab with your arm, and you go home, and you, if you want to cut the grass with your arm on, all the natural things you do in your home setting, that's where ultimately we want to go. Mm. But that's a pretty heavy lift, right? So that means all of the electronics have to work. You're not rebooting right. all the time. All that training that I was talking about, we get that understood. And so there's a lot of things there, all little tiny pieces that have to come together in order to make that take-home trial really relevant. And uh, it, what's exciting is that's where we are right now in the program. We're gearing up for that now. Very exciting. There we go. Uh, uh, I love human translation. Right, <laughs> That's exactly. what we always look for, exactly. and it, it must be very satisfying uh, to see something like this, uh, it is. especially hearing the feedback from, from people whose lives you're affecting in that sense. So that's great. Why, why don't we go to uh, NESD then? There you go. Okay. Talk about, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, program that seeks high resolution neurotechnologies capable of mitigating the effects of injury and disease on both the visual and auditory systems uh, for both sensory deficits and sensory restoration. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this sounds like if I'm wounded in, in battle and my eyeball is gone or the same wound in the civilian sector, an industrial accident, this is, a, is this a type of implant that could uh, in a sense, sort of substitute for an eyeball or an ear, or uh, this was a very complex, but walk us a little through what uh, some of this is about, if you would. Yeah, um, so let, let's, let's kind of take a quick uh, roll down the, the, the visual pathway, right? Sure. So to understand, kind of understand the problem. Okay. So, you know, when we have a digital camera or something like that, it'll be, you know, 50 megapixels, you know, every time, every little pixel is a receptor, for example. If you think about the retina, um, we have 100 and about 130 million photoreceptors in the retina itself. So you have this amazing high dynamic image, right? right. A high, uh, high fidelity image to 130 million receptors. And then there's some processing that happens in the back of the retina, right? Between what they call the inner plexiform and the outer plexiform layers. That, all of that signal that's coming in through these photoreceptors is being pre-processed there and then sent along an optical nerve. And that optical nerve is um, about a million nerve fibers in that, in that nerve itself. And then it comes back um, and ends up in the visual cortex, which is in the back of the, the, the brain here. Okay. So, and it comes into layer four, right? So if you have a situation, let's say, where there's a blast injury, and one of our soldiers may have uh, suffered a, a blast injury to the face, and as you said, you know, the, the, the eye is no longer there, right? So any sort of therapy as far as, you know, retinal stimulation or anything like that it's just not possible right? there is no retina left right so if you wanted to be able to reinstate vision of some degree then where would you go right and kind of the, the next place is, that seemed reasonable to be able to get to is the visual cortex sure. so if we're trying to rebuild a visual image and we want high acuity visual um, then or high fidelity is probably the better word, visual, then you're going to have to be talking on numbers of about a million, right? And in order to get kind of what we were getting in a natural visual environment. So how do you begin to build devices that can actually connect to the brain with these very, very high channel counts? Okay. And that's ultimately what we're after. And that's what NSD is doing. So we have a couple different approaches that we're using. Um, one of them is, is a, a group called Paradromics. They, 
they've developed this, uh, they're targeting, you know, kind of ALS patients, people that have uh, lost the ability to, to speak. Uh, they can still think about speaking. Uh, they just can't form the speech anymore. The, the muscles are no longer working. They can't actually vocalize. But is it possible that you could tap in uh, to the area of the brain where you, the speech is being formed and then collect mm -hmm. that neural data with high enough resolution that you can then translate that into some sort of audible speech that some AI engine or, or other device will then take care of. So their approach is to come up with these very, very small microwires, um, 10,000 maybe microwires all bundled together, kind of like a Utah array, but much, much, much more compact and many, many more wires and much more thin. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems that we know that happens, a slight tangent, but just I think it's good for the context, Sure. Is when you take a wire and put it into the brain, a lot of times what will happen is you cause damage to the brain. You know, you, you'll cause scarring. There's mm -hmm. astrocytes, glial cells that start surrounding that, that wire and start shielding that wire from the rest of the brain. So if you're trying to connect to the neurons and you're trying to create this communication pathway, uh, that's not what you want to have happen. Well, it turns out that the smaller the wire, the less scarring is formed. And if, if you consider a wire on diameter of a cell body, like a neuron cell body or smaller, it turns out that the scarring and the damage is significantly less. So the types of interfaces that Paradromics is building, for example, are these very, very small wires, which are smaller than the cell body and mm -hmm. not creating this, this large scarring response that you get maybe through other types of interfaces. So their point is, is can I collect enough data out of the brain so that I can rebuild visual, rebuild speech? And so Columbia University is looking at approaches where we have, uh, it's, it's what we call like a, a it's, it's a miniature, so it's about 65,000 channels in the device. It's about one centimeter square okay. and it's thinned down to about 20 microns. So this thing will be flexible and nothing in the brain is flat, right? So if you're going to lay something, let's say on top of the surface of the brain, which we call the PIA, uh, right below that are the neurons in the brain. If you want to be able to connect to those neurons without actually putting electrodes in the brain itself, then can you lay these, the, the, this device across the top and then record from and stimulate neurons that are directly below it? Mm. And so uh, th this is a device that's being built out of Columbia and uh, they have built a device now which is going to be about 65,000 channels. Mm -hmm. uh, you do the surgery, you plant it inside the brain, and you sew everything back up again, and then there's a puck that sits outside that provides all the wireless power, all the data I.O. that's needed to get the interface uh, working, getting information out of the brain and information into the brain. Um, and then this little device sits on top of the surface itself. Now, if you put that over the visual cortex and you want to stimulate different areas of the visual cortex, we're hoping, and we're not at this point yet, we're hoping that what would be perceived are these little dots that would start to show up, what we call phosphines, in your visual field. They're okay. not really there, but you perceive it because we're stimulating that area of the brain. Okay. So if we can get that stimulation small enough, and if we can have many, many, many channels doing this independently, then we have a chance of actually being able to recreate vision mm. um, with relatively decent quality um, in someone who may have completely lost it. And so that's ultimately what we're, what we're looking at. And so there's a, another approach that we're using, which is really quite fascinating, and that's out of uh, also in the NSBE program, which is a uh, course in, being done by J.B. Pierce. And the thought there is, can you use light to interoperate with the brain? So what I've been talking about all along here is these different electrical interfaces, different types mm -hmm. of devices that we implant in there. But what about if we were able to modify a neuron so that it would actually bioluminesce, mm. right? It's kind of like, you know, when you're walking on the beach and you step on sand and your footprint glows, you know? So, it, you know, can you take that and actually modify neurons that every time they fire, they give off some photons? And then you build a very, very sensitive device that again sits on the pia of the brain and picks up these photons. So in that case, uh, you're not actually putting anything in the brain at all. It's still a surgical implantation, uh, but it's a completely different type of way of interacting with the brain. It's all through light. And so what's nice about light is very, very fast. Um, and you could potentially put this in different parts of the brain and have it expressed just in those small areas. So this would give me that, 
that fidelity that I'm looking for, but it's not using um, any electrodes in the brain at all. It's all using a light interface instead, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So the trick is there is actually getting the, the neuron to bioluminesce, and there's some things that you got to there, there that you got to do, uh, which makes it a lot harder. So when we're thinking about you know, getting through the FDA and getting through all the different approval processes that would have to be done. Things like that would be a longer pole in the tent, but from a darker perspective, you know, what would be possible if you had an optical interface to the brain versus an electrical electrode interface to the brain? And this is one of these programs, uh, this particular performer is one of these performers that allows us to open that door and actually look at what might be possible and how to compare and contrast that against maybe ele electric versions that are being developed, for example. But all of these, you know, there's no reason why it couldn't be applied to other parts of the brain, as long as you can get to high enough channel count, and those channels look at a very, very small piece of the brain. That's the big deal, right? With EEG, for example, you, know, you can do that non-invasively now, but you're picking up these huge swaths of brain, you know, there's these very large signals, uh, or signals that represent very large areas of the brain, and so the fidelity just isn't there for fine-tuned movement, you know, that you can get out of EEG signals. We gotta do better than that. Mm -hmm. And some of these types of approaches in these devices will allow us to explore that a bit, a bit more thoroughly. To, to, to most people in the, in, in the lay uh, domain, listening to you, I mean, it sounds, you know, it sounds like science fiction and obviously uh, to you, it's, it must be amazing, <laughs> gratifying working with these types of tools. But as you were saying, uh, you know, DARPA, you know, your time at DARPA is always limited. Uh, but uh, needless to say, I, I, I think, I, I guess, unless I'm wrong, you, you're always thinking about, the, <laughs> about what's possible uh, next, uh, 10 years, 15 and so forth. Um, you know, it was uh, at the beginning, you know, you mentioned early on in your time with the Air Force, um, you know, it was back in the days of Matthew Broderick in the War Games movie. Thinking about you, obviously, what came, I'm on the same schedule as you pretty much. Um, thinking of you, uh, I you thought, what well, first thing that came to mind was the, uh, the uh, Natalie Woods, Christopher Walken movie Brainstorm from the early uh, 1980s, which uh, involved not war stuff, but, uh, you know, how advanced neurotechnologies thought of, 40 years ago could be used to create, you know, virtual reality type simulations and so forth inside the brain. That being said, uh, what types of things just off the cuff do you see uh, potentially beyond obviously uh, these medical uh, and health applications? Um, you know, if, you, if you take us out 20 years or so, um, any, any interesting sort of consumerish entertainment? Uh, where, where, where do you see some of these possibilities taking us uh, beyond just the things that we're doing at DARPA? You know, I, I think, you know, from, from our perspective, you know, all my programs in the, in the portfolio are focused on, you know, what's the national security need for what, sure. for what it is that we're building, right? And so, you know, knowing that these programs take a while to come to fruition and um, technologies that I'm talking about today Will still take many years to get through all sure. the FDA approvals and so on, right? But you know, assuming that there's success or even partial success coming out of these programs, you know, the NQ program, I think to me, is from a national security perspective, it's one of these programs that begin to open up brain machine interfaces to a much larger population, sure. right? So right now, you know, we've been focused on recovery of function. Right, you know, a, a wounded warrior, a soldier has been harmed in, yep. in duty, and how do we get them back to a position that we can re, re, re provide function that might have been lost? Now, all of all of my programs have been focused on that. Now, the NQ technology, the NQ program, begins to open this up a bit more because while even for for clinical applications, wouldn't it be great if you could avoid surgery, yep. right? Even if, so, therefore, if you can do it non-invasively versus an invasive approach, that would be great. Mm -hmm. So, if it's not invasive and it's safe, now does do any of these technologies now begin to potentially apply to a larger population, to the able-bodied soldier from from my world, for example, and in, in your context, to the larger population, right? Mm -hmm. But I definitely believe that these types of interfaces, as they become more um, proven and more acceptable and proven that, you know, there is, that we understand the interface of the neuro, to, the, to the brain, we understand there's no harm being done. Just because it's not invasive doesn't mean it's not harmful, right? Sure. You have to be able to prove all of this and do all the appropriate, do all the appropriate experimentation. But that being said, 
I mean, wouldn't it be nice to get beyond a keyboard and a mouse, right? Oh, yeah. And so that's been around ever since the, the computer's been here. And so when we're thinking about how our soldiers work in these environments, um, think, about, think about cyber, for example. Okay. This is one of the use cases I run through my head a lot. And that is, you know, I have a, I have a you know, my, my job is cyber defense. You know, so I'm looking at a network. Right now, you know, I would probably have four or five screens in front of me, I, showing me all the different things that I need to know about whatever my job is in cyber defense. All of that, I, I might get an auditory cue, maybe there's a bell or something that goes off, but for the most part, it's all coming in through my visual system. I'm being overloaded through my visual system and I don't have anything else happening. So would it be possible that I would be able to wear a non-invasive brain machine interface mm -hmm. that would be able to stimulate my brain in somatosensory areas that, that are with a unique signal that would be, if a certain node on my network is being attacked, I would feel it. Right. So when we talk about being in the network, right, or defending a network, I mean, you're literally maybe in the network and the network actually maybe feels like it's a part of you. Right. Mm. It's, an, it's an extension of what you what your body image is. So when you're looking at in a cyber defense perspective, rather than having everything coming in through my visual system, I now kind of have a little bit more of a, I wouldn't say a whole body understanding, but, but certainly more sensory input as to how to understand my space. And we do this every day, right? I mean, we're using all of our senses in parallel all the time. Sure. But if I put myself in this with blinders on and all I'm doing is looking at my cyber network through, through a video screen, then there's all this other sensory input that I'm just ignoring that could be there. But we'd have to figure out how to translate what's happening on a cyber network into a sensory signal that makes sense or that we could use. And so what's interesting about this is one of the things that we've learned under haptics is we tried very hard to try and change that sensor signal that i was talking about that resistance signal mm -hmm. and turn it into a signal that we put on the nerve and make it feel as natural as possible so that a person would say yes i feel pressure yep. you know that means that change in resistance means a change in pressure what we're finding is that the subjects will say well it kind of feels like pressure, or it's kind of itchy, it's kind of scratchy. Mm. Um, so they have to create new words for a sense that they've not ever felt before. Mm. Because we haven't been able to get it right, right? We don't mm. know exactly what the brain needs in order to get the feeling of pressure. We can get close and we can tweak it a little bit, but there's still a lot of work there to be done. But in a way, that actually might work to our advantage. So back in my use case of I'm sitting in front of a cyber defense network um, and, and my neural interface is, is basically sending a signal into my somatosensory system and I can feel a, a node being attacked. I don't want that to feel like anything else in my body. Otherwise it feels like somebody's just touching me on the shoulder, right. right? But if it feels a little different, then I know that signal's coming from my cyber network. It's not coming from my environment that I'm literally sitting in and maybe somebody's touching me, for example. Yeah. So you want these signals to be a little different. Sure. So from that perspective, that's good, right? Because we haven't quite figured out how to get it exact anyway. Um, but anytime I think, you know, in a military environment where you can be able to invoke multiple sensory input and do that in a, in a way that increases your, your awareness of your surroundings and your effectiveness as a soldier, then that's, that's where we want to go. It's got to be safe. It's got to be all of that. All that's got to be proven out without question. But when we, we get past some of those initial safety studies and make sure that we're on the right track, that to me is something that, that would be, I think, very, very possible. Awesome. Al, just there's one um, wrap up question. We, we typically give our guests, obviously, um, you know, between DARPA, uh, Spaywar, the Air Force, Syracuse, uh, your college counselor in high school, uh, you right. had a lot of. Uh, mentors, uh, a lot of people are helping to influence you along this path. Uh, anybody specifically, or it could be a group uh, of folks that uh, you might want to shout out to mention at this point that specific, you know, if it wasn't for them, uh, Dr. Al Amandi would be uh, practicing law or selling real estate or, <laughs> or doing something totally different than this. Uh, anyone you want to specifically mention or highlight? Uh, as we wrap the show up? Yeah, I think there's, there's, there's three to come to mind. Unfortunately, uh, my dad has passed and he passed a little while ago, but he's, he's certainly one, right? I mean, 
he taught me, as I said, he didn't go to school, he didn't go to college, I mean, he didn't went to high school, he didn't go to college. And when he ended his career, um, he was he was at Sears and Roebuck, he was in charge of the East Coast, of the East of the Mississippi, flying around in Lear jets. And, and really, I thought, when I look at what's possible, and just focusing on something and really giving it your all, he's someone that I could really relate to. Mm -hmm. um, that it's possible, right? Sure. So, so just just having that drive, I think, clearly comes from my 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 family unit for sure. Um, the, the other one that comes to mind is when I was in in Wilkes University, Dr. Najib. He was the, the head of engineering at Wilkes, and I remember a discussion with him, thinking it was right when I was wrapping up my bachelor's, thinking, ah, oh, you know, this is interesting. Not I'm in college, I might as well stay in college. Uh, I want to go on for my master's. And his his advice to me was great go for it but get a job first uh because what's going to happen is you're going to come out of your master's degree and you'll you'll certainly have a a, a more superior degree over a bachelor's but you won't have the work experience and you'll also likely find an employer that is willing to pay for your master's while you're getting work experience at the same time and in hindsight for me that was the right advice oh, yeah. and so it gave me when i was learning advanced communications and advanced signal processing in my master's program, I was applying it to my job. It gave me some relevant context. Rather than just being book smart, it actually gave me relevant context on how to separate this system at the Pentagon and do different things that I had to do, and then understanding the theory behind it because I was taking classes as we went. So that, to me, was kind of like a hands-on application of what I was learning in my master's program back towards you know, what I was trying to do at work. So for me, that worked. That was the right way to go. Um, and then, and then um, I think the other one, you know, a lot of these are, are early in my career, now that you asked me this question, but another one was uh, Peter Leong. And he was my supervisor at Air Force Research Lab. Hmm. And he was the one that said that you know, this software radio program is gonna be the beginning of really a whole new venture in the way that we build radios. And that's very true today. It is completely, it had some fundamental changes in the DOD acquisition system and what's mm -hmm. actually possible. I mean, DARPA still has ongoing uh, research happening in cognitive radio, trying to understand how radios work smartly in, in a very complex spectrum. And some of that very, very early work, um, I was happy to say that at least I was part of. And it was um, something that um, I find very rewarding from that perspective. Outstanding, outstanding. Um, real, really amazing stuff, Al. Um, it's it's just uh, <laughs> listening to the the passion behind it is is wonderful. But just seeing how much you've achieved and uh, really going to be looking forward to following. I mean, everything that DARPA does, but specifically, you know, your portfolio. Uh, as I said, <laughs> when I did the show with uh, Dr. Van Giesen last time, I wish you could be there for <laughs> for twenty more years and keep going. But I know, you know. The times are limited, but uh, re really, really amazing stuff and appreciating you spending time talking about it all. Um, for everybody that's going to be uh, watching this episode or listening to the various uh, podcast uh, platforms that the Idea Me Show goes out on, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. Alamondi, Program Manager in the Biologic Technology Office at DARPA, uh, doing really amazing things with neurotechnology and brain-computer interfaces, not just for, obviously for the military, but also for the civilian sector. Uh, Al, thank you for, for taking the time out of your schedule to, to spend with us and, and go through your portfolio. Thank you for everything you're doing for the human condition, and as we say on the show, um, thank you for moving the human story forward uh, with everything you're doing. It's, it's just truly amazing stuff. Thanks, Ari. It was a it was a pleasure to talk to you. It was great meeting you uh, over over Zoom, and maybe uh, when we get on the other side of COVID, <laughs> we'll be able to, to to meet up sometime. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, it was great talking to you, and uh, thanks. Absolutely, definitely.